Why? Because it was three chapters. Just it just seemed like a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I add some articles to the learning engagement for more information. But to yeah. me, I think it's for like when I do my learning engagements. I think the articles we it really it really helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially this semester, I added some videos about the coronavirus and leadership and other courses that I'm those um those links don't there's not any clickable links um why when I when I see that like it, some of the links that you share on there don't have anything to click on I will check it after class okay and like, um oh. What is the, um, I have a, like a little red block for the watching the videos. Is that where it's set like under your completion tasks? Yes. yes. That's fine. Okay. After the name, there is another link here. Sometimes you click on the name of the chapter of the video and it's with open. Sometimes it is not related to YouTube. I should add an, add an extra link to the name and it is under the name. But I have checked it, I will check it again tonight. But I have checked it to be correct to use for the students for both the courses I have this term. It is leadership and also your course. To know about the new trends because of coronavirus in management and leadership, it is very important to know about it. It is very important because after you will graduate, undergraduate, Coronavirus will be your lifestyle as a manager. You should know the new information about the coronavirus. Because of that, I have a great emphasis on knowing about the pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus situations of management, leadership, and also psychological aspects of coronavirus. So let me share my... Yes. Okay, one of the good topics of behavior. What is motivation? What do you know about motivation? How can you define the motivation? And what is the difference between motivation and inspiration? Is there any difference or not the same or no? Totally different each other. What are the components? Motivation is like your reasoning um, to do something. Motivation? Mm -hmm. So it's a cognition. It is an intellectual part of our mind or not emotional part, which? I think it's both. Which is dominant? Which side is dominant? Which aspect is dominant? When you are motivated, you are a lot of it's your. Uh, or You're a lot of passion. Passionate. Amy, how do you think? Mm -hmm. I think, um, mm, like motivate, like uh -huh. it means, uh, mm. it's a passion, it's a feeling or not. It, uh, thought system, it's a thinking, it's a intellectual part of our mind, rational, not emotional. Courtney says both parts are engaged mm. to creating motivation in our life. I think that we have, not I, psychology thinks based upon the textbook that motivation has two parts. One, force, two, direction. When you are motivated for something, you are force yourself for achievement, for getting that thing. And you have a good direction to find the way to, for this achievement. If you have only passion, it is not motivation. A lot of people has a, have a lot of passion about a lot of things, but they don't know what they should do to achieve them. They don't, they didn't have any direction 
about what they want. It is not motivation, it is only force, but it's only passion. Some people has a very rigid and inflexible and certain program, certain direction for achieving their goals, but they don't do anything. They don't have enough passion to achieve their goals. Also, they are not motivated. They are only goal directed, but stop at the same point for all for whole day life. So motivation, as Courtney says, has two parts. One part intellectual, it is called goal direction behavior. One part passion force. Force and directions are the most basic, most crucial and fundamentals of motivating behavior. The nature of motivation. The set of forces that leads people to behave in a particular waves. Set of forces and to behave, two parts. The importance of motivation. Job performance or P depends upon motivation, ability and environment. It's like a mathematical formulation. Job performance depends on three elements. One, motivation, two, ability, and three, environment. Total score of these elements will create your job performance score, job performance grade, job performance point. How you are motivated? A well-motivated man or woman with no expert and with no specific ability or in an undesirable environment cannot do the best of him, the best of her. Why? Because of the abilities are very important. Also someone with a high quality of abilities and without any force, any direction, and also without any appropriate environment for developing his skills, he or she cannot be, have, cannot have a good job performance and also about the environment. P, is equal M plus A plus E. It is job performance. Motivational framework you for, provides a useful <clears throat> way to see how motivational processes occur. When people experience a need deficiency, they seek ways to satisfy it, which results in a choice of goal-directed behaviors. After performing the behavior, the individual experiences reward or punishments that affect the original need deficiency. It is called reinforcement. Reinforcement is the process by which the probability of recurrence of something will increase. The reinforcement is the process by which the probability of recurrence of something of an event, of an occurrence, pre-occurrence will increase. It is uh, by reward. Punishment doesn't have any uh, reinforcement effect on your behavior. And as I have talked about it in several times, for stopping the negative behaviors, punishment is very good. For stopping the negative emotion, negative behaviors, but for creating the new positive behaviors, punishment doesn't work at all. Only reward, only reward and only reward. For creating new habits, for creating new behaviors and other parts. So we have a reward and uh, punishment system also in our brain. It's a circuit, neural circuit that works about the punishment and about the reward. Experience need deficiencies will lead to search ways to satisfy needs, lead to choice of goal-directed behaviors. Based upon our goal-directed behaviors, we enactment of behavioral choice. It is called performance. Performance, what is the definition of performance? Enactment of behavioral choice. After that, experience reward or punishment. It is related to the outcome of your performance, consequences of your action, consequences of your performance. 
And after that, reassessment on need deficiencies. It is met or not met. It is deficient again or not. And after that experience, again, need deficiency, if there is a need deficiency. If it is not, it is over and you can go for another motivational fragment. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what does it mean like the enactment? Like Enactment, it is creating behavioral choice. Doing behavioral choice, act. Its roots is act. Enactment, it is activation, activating the behavioral choice. You have several choices. For example, you can have a bad mood about your needs. It is not behavioral choice. It is emotional choice. You can choose some of the choice which are not efficient for meeting your needs. Also, it is a behavioral choice, but it is not efficient behavioral choice because it doesn't work for meeting your needs. And after ending these behaviors, you will be so tired and sometimes you are so tired and a lot of loss of energy, sense of loss of energy or fatigue, sense of fatigue. But enactment of behavioral choice is mean that how or what choice of behaviors have you chosen for your targets? Because of that, you experience reward or punishment. The motivational framework. How motivational processes occur? At first, you should identify your needs. Burning desire is the most, is the greatest motivator for every human action. Burning desire. Burning desire, as John Paul Mayer says, is the greatest motivator for every human action in the history of the human being. But what is the root of burning desire? Also, it is called desire, not need, I know. But the basic part of all aspects of our desire is our needs. So you should at first identify your needs for achieving your goals. And after that, for choosing your goal-directed behavior or behavioral choice. And after that, enacting your behavioral choice. And after that, look at your consequences of action. And what are the consequences? Are they punishment or not? They are rewarded. And after that, are your uh, needs met or not? If it, they are met, okay, let's go to another need. If it is not met, again, you should reform, uh, you should feedback about the circulation of your need and your motivation process. And again, and again, again, until that you will see yes, yes, my needs are met. So the first element of the motivational process is need. Anything an individual requires or wants, requires or wants, basic needs are required. Meta needs or hierarchical needs are wanting. They are not required. For example, eating is a physiological need. Yes, and you, you require eating to maintain your life. But self-esteem is not a physiological need. You want to have good self-esteem, to have good self-fulfillment and other parts of your needs. Some needs are about your existence, which is the needs of being, some needs about your growth. It is called growth needs, being needs and growth needs. Need a deficiency triggers attempts to satisfy the need. Yes, I have some need. I should understand some deficiency is my need. Goal-directed behaviors. It is the most important part of motivation. Motivating people can be on a goal-directed behavior, on a goal-directed pathway for a long time. They have a high rate of persistency and consistency and congruency between their mind, 
their thinking, their emotions, and their behaviors. We have three parts in my mind, thinking, emotion, and behavior. These parts of mind are called rational triangle or cognitive triangle, including thinking, feeling, acting, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. These are called cognitive or rational triangle or sometimes triad. These are the main elements of our mind. So we can use everything in these aspects. Yes, is it from our rational part, emotional part, or behavioral part? You can consider behavioral part very easy. Why? Because you can measure and observe your behaviors. But you as an ordinary people, not as an, a specialist expert, in assessing. As an ordinary people, sometimes you cannot find that it is emotion or it is thought. Why? You cannot observe your emotions. You can feel. But about other people, you cannot observe and measure. As an ordinary people, you cannot observe or measure other people's emotions or other people's thinkings. So the observable and measurable parts is only behavior. Result from individuals trying to satisfy their need deficiencies. Reward and punishment, conquer, which is the consequence of your action, are consequences of the goal-directed behavior and reassessment of need deficiency occurs after the person assisted extent to which the outcome addressed the original need deficiencies. Is there any need deficiency again? Okay, again, goal-directed behavior and rewards and punishment and feedback. If there is no need deficiency in that need, okay, it's over. The motivational framework, the motivational process is over. Historical perspectives on motivation. The traditional approaches. Scientific manager, the father of scientific manager in management is Frederick Taylor, I think at the end of the 19th century and the first years of 20th century. Assumes that employees are motivated solely by money. Why it is not? Is it true or not? Are people are motivated solely by I don't money? think solely, no. Why? Because there's the, like the human relations approach and the human resource approach where you want to be genuinely contributing or generally helping people. There wouldn't be volunteers and charities. Yes. But ordinary, do you think what are the major elements over the money? What are the major elements more important than money as a motivation our outside? Needs. What? Acquiring enough to satisfy our needs. Mm -hmm. Satisfy our needs. Okay. Can you satisfy your needs, all your needs by your money? No. Which type of needs you cannot satisfy with the money? Um, emotional. Yes. If you don't have money, how can you be in a love? In America, <laughs> they say no money, no honey. How do you think about this proverb? <laughs> also, I know it's a joke. But I want you to uh, assert and to express your uh, thinking about it because you will be the next generation of managers and leaders. And a lot of people will ask you about it that as an educated manager or leader, how do you think about the importance of money, not wealth? Wealth is something else. Wealth is not money. You know a lot of rich people that they are not happy. You know that a lot of people that they don't have any physical wealth and physical health also. Health is a major part of wealth. Also, we need money. It is not about rejecting money. Why rejecting, accepting? But it is about the excessive importance, excessive perceived importance of money. 
It is not about the money. It is about the perceived money and excessive perceived importance of money. A lot of people think that, a lot of people thought that, not in, I think in the, at least from 20 or 30 years ago, many people think that, no, money is not everything. Every rich man or woman say you that money is not everything. Every rich man or woman. Yes, poor people think that money is everything. But any rich man or woman say you, yes, money is very good. Why not? But money is not everything. Nothing is not everything. Nothing is not everything. Money is everything? No. Love is everything? No. Education is everything? No. Religion is everything? No. Nothing is not everything. Anything has its specific role in our life. For example, Courtney has a good, pretty, beautiful daughter, okay? What can you constitute, what can you replace instead of modern love to the daughter? Money? Other love partners, even husband, religion, happiness, alcohol, meditation, beauty, expert, a sport, anything. It is very unique sense of being as a mother, as a woman. I think everything is like this. Everything has its specific importance and a specific role in our mind, in our life. But basic for security, you know, what are the five basic, what are the five hierarchical needs of Maslow? Do you know? First is basic needs, physiological needs. Second level, needs for security. Third, needs for love and belongingness. Fourth, needs for self-esteem. And five needs for fulfillment or self-actualization, okay? Yes, at the level of basic needs, and yes, at the level of security, sometimes very, very short part of our love and belongingness is related to money. But the huge part of love and belongingness and self-esteem at all and self-fulfillment and self-actualization is not absolutely related to your money. It is related to your sense of prosperity. If you have a good sense of prosperity with or without money, you are self-acting yourself. If you don't have any good sense of prosperity with a lot of money, you don't feel security. You don't feel financial security. You are always a financial dependent to your pocket, to your job and other parts. So scientific management, which started with Frederick Taylor at the end of 19th century and the beginning of the first years of 20th century, assumes that employees are motivated solely by money. It's a very traditional view about how we can motivate other people. The human relations approach, what it says, assumes employees need outweighed money and that fostering favorable employee attitudes, the illusion of involvement results in motivation. It says that the major part, the major motivator of human being, every human action is human relations, which is not related straight with money. The human resource approach. In human resource approach, in different parts of an organization, one part is human relations, public relations. One part is human resources. For example, when we want to create motivation as a, from the aspect or approach of human relation, we assume that employees need outfit money and that fostering favorable employee attitudes. But in human resource approach, we say, People want to make genuine contribution. Managers should encourage their participation by providing the pro proper working environment condition. These are the basic theories and approaches about the, how we can create 
motivation in our employees. Another approach is about self-efficacy. What is the definition of self-efficacy? How do you think about it? What is self-efficacy? Your confidence in being able to succeed. Yes. And what is the difference between self-efficacy and self-confidence? Is it the same or not? No, it's not the same. Self-confidence is um, your belief in your ability to do something. Thank you. Thank you. And what that about was a, That was a quiz question last week. <laughs> yes. Yes, I know. Self-efficacy, it is about your sense of succeed. It is your locus of control, external or internal. More external lower self-efficacy, sense of self-efficacy. There are some different approaches to self-efficacy, self-confidence and self-esteem. And after that, uh, self-image and self-concept. These are the components of our thinking about self. Five major parts, self-esteem, self-confidence and self-efficacy to get uh, together, combine the self uh, concept and self-concept self plus the body image will organize, will shape your self-image. These are the part of the self, uh, also in one of the theories of uh, science of self. In that part, they say yes. Sometimes people, uh, sometimes some scientists of psychology say that self-esteem, self-confidence and self-efficacy are from the type of judgment, rational. And some of them say, no, it is not about the rational. It is about the feeling, about the emotion. How do you feel about your, your importance in your successes? It is called, for example, self-efficacy. How do you feel about your self-abilities? Uh, it is not about judgment. There are not a share meaning between the different approaches but finally, we know that the key word are value for self-esteem, ability for self-confidence, and success or succeed for self-efficacy. The three dimensions of self-efficacy are magnitude, strength, and generality. The best theory of uh, the basic theory, and sometimes it is the best theory about self-efficacy is for Albert Bandura. Albert Bandura is still alive. And I think is the professor of Stanford. And two phrases are coined in psychology, in social psychology by Albert Bandura. At first, observational learning or social learning. And second, it is self-efficacy. These are the phrases in psychology, social psychology which are coined by Albert Bandura from the Canada, British Columbia, CB, um, University of UBC, and also Stanford. So the, in the theory of Albert Bandura about the self-efficacy, we see three elements for self-efficacy. First, magnitude, which is about how difficult a task can be accomplished. Two, a strength, which is about how confident the person is the task can be accomplished. And third, generality believes about the degree to which similar tasks can be accomplished. Highly recommended to you to study some theories of psychology for becoming a different leader, a different manager. One of them is the theory about the self-efficacy and observational learning. It will help you to analyze your employees and coworkers better than other managers or leaders that doesn't know so deep about these concepts. Another concept is emotional intelligence that I know in a lot of courses like organizational theory, like leadership, like other parts of your management theories and management courses you are taking in the uh, program or bachelor program you know about the, you know, a lot about the emotional intelligence. But focus on it. It is very important, very, very important. 
and it can help you in your private life and personal life, non-organizational life even. Emotional intelligence, we have a lot of uh, working, a lot of articles about the, in industrial psychology about the emotional intelligence. Need-based perspective on motivation. Need-based theories on motivation. Assume that need deficiency calls behavior at first. The hierarchy of need of Muslim, we talk, assume that human needs are arranged in a hierarchy of importance, basic or deficiency needs, physiological and security. The first two hierarchy, two level are basic or deficiency needs. And after that, and belongingness also, growth needs are self-esteem and self-actualization. In some categorization, they said that beloved and belongingness is not about the deficiency needs. It is about growth needs. In some categorization, like your uh, course book says that no, belong, love and belongingness is a deficiency need. I think love and belongingness is a growth need, not an efficient deficiency need. So we have two parts of needs, deficiency needs and growth needs. If you cannot meet your deficiency needs, you will die. It's very important. Your surviving is related to your deficiency needs. Social surviving, physical surviving, spiritual surviving, surviving, not growth. Only stay alive. If you don't have belongingness, love is something different in this theory. Love is different from belongingness in the Maslow theory of hierarchy of needs. Love is only for a person that you can have sex with him or with her. It is lovely part. Belongingness is not related to sex. It's related to your family member, your peer group, your social friends, close friends. It is the sense of belongingness. Also, we say love and belongingness. But very professionally, you know, I want to ask you uh, as an expert in these phrases, I say, yes, there is some differences between love definition in the hierarchy of needs Maslow theory and sense of belongingness. Sense of belongingness has a broad area for belongingness. Love is for the same person that you can have sex or something physical relationship. It is very intimate. The major part of love theory is intimate and passion. In love theory of, uh, we have two major theory about love. One of them is love triangle or love triad by Strenberg. It, it says that love has three parts, commitment, passion, and intimacy. And other uh, love theory is for uh, Helen Fisher. Helen Fisher is the newest theory about the components of love and also about cheating. You can see the very good video on TEDx by Helen Fisher, why we love, why we cheat. It is in TED and it is biological basis of cheating, biological basis of loyalty, biological, biological uh, basis of love. And she says, and she has done a lot of, conducted a lot of researches, uh, uh, searches and researches about the uh, love components, basically says, yes, it is a physiological component, but it has a lot of side effect and outcome at the rational part of your mind, emotional living, and also in your social living. You see here again, the Maslow hierarchy of needs consists of five basic categories of needs. This figure illustrates both general and organizational example of each type. For example, for a person, sustenance is a physiological need. For uh, an organization, base salary is an organizational need, basic need. Or a stability for a person is a type of security needs. And pension plan is a security need for an organization. And friendship is an 
uh, type of belongingness need for a one person individual. And frenzy work group is the other parts of organizational example for sense of belongingness. Self-esteem or esteem needs, it is a status in your social status is your self-esteem in your society. And job title in organization is your esteem or self-esteem. And self-actualization needs for individual is achievement and an organization is challenging job. It is the not the first uh, theory about the motivation and needs in human, but it is the first popular and the most popular theory in the field of motivation and needs, theory by Abraham Maslow. ERG theory, uh, coined by Alder for described existence, E, relatedness, R, and growth needs. We have three types of needs, growth needs, relatedness needs, and existence needs. Assumption says that more than one need may motivate a person at the same time. It is not at the one time, at the same time, only one need, only existent need, only relatedness needs, only growth needs. For example, again, we are talking about Courtney. Having a good taking the courses for bachelor degree, it is about growth needs. But her role as a mother is about relatedness needs and also existence needs. His future existence, afterlife existence is related to his family member, her daughter, okay? But studying in university is not about the existence, it's about the growth. So you can see, for example, in Courtney that she is managing several aspects of her needs, existence needs, relative needs with their family members, with their friends, with their co-workers, with the other people, and also growth needs as an educating, training, and earning money and other parts. So the first assumption in this ERG theory coined by Alderfer is more than one it may motivate a person at the same time. Second, satisfaction progression and frustration regression components imply that a person may not state at the same level of need in Maslow hierarchy of need. If you are satisfied, you will progress. If you are frustrated, you will regret. So one positive component, one positive couples are satisfaction progression and one negative couple is frustration regression okay here's where two factor or dual structure theory assume that motivation as a construct has two separate dimensions motivation factors which affect satisfaction and hygiene factor which determine dissatisfaction it is called in psychology, it is called avoidance approach, avoidance approach system. One type and one part of your motivation is related to approaching some desirable, some favorable things in your life. And other part of movement on a part of direction is related to your avoidance of undesirable things in your life. So we have two things, good things, bad things, positive emotions, negative emotions. We like, we don't like, we dislike, okay? So it is approach and avoidance. Motivation factors, which affect satisfaction and hygiene factors, which determines that this satisfaction. Hygiene factors, this means health factors, factors that related to your existence, your survival. As your motivation occurs through job enrichment, one's hygiene factors are addressed. It is very important. When motivation occurs through job enrichment, when hygiene factors are addressed. At first, 
like Maslow. The second part is not sense of belongingness. The second part, yes, I am alive and I want to stay alive. Sense of security is means. The approaches, the instruments, the conditions then that provides me the sense of staying alive. It is called sense of security, need for security. After that, that I know that I am alive and I can stay alive after that I am looking for my relationships, for my social relationships, for my friends, for my love partner, for my co-workers, for my belongingness, for my love relationships. If I don't know that tomorrow I will be alive or not, I'm not crazy to looking for, for example, relativeness or belongingness or love. This sentence in this slide says that with the other meanings. Assume motivation occurs through job enrichment once hygiene factors are addressed. Criticisms. Maybe both method and culture bound. Yes. Method of thinking about the these uh, problems and the culture of organizational culture or social culture. Fails to account for individual differences. In this uh, method uh, and this looking at the uh, motivation, there is no consideration for individual differences. And factors, for example, payments may affect both dimensions. You see also here in this graph, two-factor theory of motivation. Acquired needs framework, McCulliland. It is very famous. McCulliland has the most famous, I think, social attribution test in psychology, in social psychology. Social psychology is very, very near to industrial psychology and also to management and culture basis that is like management, like leadership, social psychology has a lot of valid investigation about the organizational factors or organizational behaviors. One of the instruments, one of the tests, one of the questioners we use in social psychology, also in industrial psychology for assessing, for gathering information about the employees or coworkers feelings or uh, attitudes to their job, job atmosphere, to their, their social atmosphere, to their family atmosphere is McCulliland, the need for achievement. One of the first persons that was so courageous to use the word achievement in psychology because, for example, in the time of Freud or after that, between the uh, middle of 20th century, between the middle, between the uh, World War II, it was a taboo in psychology to uh, talk about the word like achievement. It was not psychology in that time. It was for the businessman or businesswoman and for the economist people. Uh, Macaulay was one of the first persons that was so courageous, so brave to use this word as an academic word and creating test and questionnaire for assessing the level of achievement, the need for achievement. Some people say that the joint between social psychology and industrial psychology was made by McClellan. He's very famous in social psychology and industrial psychology. The desire to accomplish a task or goal more effectively than was done in the past. It is the need for achievement. It is the meaning of achievement. Achievement is not doing new tasks. Achievement it is getting better every day than yesterday. Every day than yesterday. Better and better and better. Never ending improvement. The desire, it is from the type of emotion, feeling, the desire, not thinking, not rationality, not judgment. It is the desire to accomplish a task or goal more effectively than was done in the past. It is the operational definition and conceptual also definition uh, for the need for achievement. The need for affiliation, it is the other parts of 
a needs framework. The need for human companionship, affiliation, and the need for power. Uh oh, you know, in a lot of psychological and manage, management and leadership theories, we have an oppositional status between the power and affiliation, between the power and friendship, power and empathy. It is very bad that uh, many power holders we lack their empathetic feelings about other people and we lack the sensitivity to others in their future. So one of the greatest and best elements in the McClelland theory is gathering two apparently oppositional component, which is called affiliation and power together in one theory. The desire to control the resources is one's environment, in one environment. It is about the resources. So affiliation is about the companionship achievement. It is about the more effectively and the power is resources in one's environment. Focus on process-based perspectives. It was between this, but need-based after that Macaroland with Macaulay, we enter to the process base. <coughs> Why people choose certain behavioral points to satisfy their needs? Why? How do you think? Can you repeat the question, please? why people choose certain behavioral points to satisfy their needs. It could be um, self-motivated, like if, it, if they have a need that they need to satisfy or group motivated, if they're trying to do a better, um, like a greater cause type thing. Uh, what is, for example, the difference between you and I mean, to choose the behavioral points. What are the factors that impa impact the process of choosing some behavioral points for satisfying your needs, for meeting your needs? Um, well, I, um, there'll be more severe consequences if I didn't show up for a job uh, and I have um, two children to feed and I need that paycheck. So I will make sure I'm on time and perform at work. Mm -hmm or opposed to somebody who doesn't have as great as a need to behave that way. Mm -hmm. How do you think, Amy? Um, I think, um, like, hmm. like our motivations, um, what motivates me is different than what motivates her. So it is about the individual differences. It is about the personality traits or yeah. character. Yes. And it is about your parental style, parenting style. And it is about your attachment style. Is it about attachment style? Attach attachment? Yeah, the major, the other major theory you should know as a leader is attachment style, attachment theory by John Balby. It will help you a lot to know your employees very, very, very more usefully or more effectively. And also, especially for your personal life. Attachment Theory by John Balby. Okay. Emotional quotient or EQ or emotional intelligence. Attachment Theory by John Balby. Self-efficacy and observational learning by uh, Albert Bandra. And do I remember other theories? These are not theory. These are some parts of practical theories 
we use these theories in therapy and in counseling. So if you know and you understand so deep, have a good understanding about this theory, you will be so different from other managers, other leaders. Because the general courses, every manager, every undergraduate or graduate manager or leader have taken these courses, mm -hmm. it is very good, but there is no difference. Everybody go for MBA, relatively the same courses. The difference is about the things that somebody knows more than other people and understand and can apply in real life, in real personal life, in real organizational life, in their relationship life, love life, and social life, other parts of life. If you can know and use it in an applicable behavior in your daily life, especially your personal life and job life, yes. At that point, it is the turning point. It is the chaining point. It is the point that you can have some dominancy against other managers because your specific combination of the theories that or other managers don't know or if they know they cannot combine, combine together and have a total integrated perspective about the for example human behaviors because of that I emphasize that you should know some specific psychological theories so deeply. All these theories have some parts specific for job. All these theories, self-efficacy, observational learning, social learning, and emotional questions, several books about the role of EQ, how we can use EQ and EI, emotional intelligence on emotional question in the workplace. And now, about the attachment theory. Okay, thank you for contribution. How people evaluate their satisfaction after they have attained these goals? It is a basic question. It is not about your needs. It is a process of meeting your needs. How people evaluate their satisfaction after they have attained these goals. Many people will attain their, their goals and say, yes, in the process of attainment, I was happier than when achievement. They say attainment process was happier in attainment process. We were happier than when we achieve our goals. What are the process during the uh, achievement and attainment? The equity theory of motivation focuses on desire to be treated with equity and to avoid perceived inequity. It is very important. Uh, what is the symbolic uh, protest about the equity and inequity for motivation? If you think that you have some racial, gender-based, sexual, ethnical, national, and any, if you think any type of inequity in yourself or in your society or in your community, it creates a lot of motivational forces to battle against the inequity factors. Inequity is a perceptual belief that one is being treated fairly in relation to others. Don't forget it. Note that it is perceptual belief. It is perceived belief. Sometimes it is not true, but your perception, your perceptual belief, your perceived belief is that, yes, they don't treat me fairly in relation to others. They don't treat me so fairly. It is your perceived, yes, your perception, I know. Inequity is a perceptual belief that one is being treated unfairly in relation to others. And the equity comparison is means outcome to inputs, uh, outcomes to inputs of self compared with outcomes to inputs of others. Do you know the meaning, the technical 
phrase we use for the ratio of input, output to input, what is called the ratio between output to input. It is called efficiency. The operation of definition of efficiency is the ratio of output to input, which is always less than one, less than 100 well, less than 100% or less than one. Because always output is smaller than input. We have some waste, wasting in time, wasting in energy, wasting in money. The operational definition of efficiency or sometimes efficacy is the ratio between output to input. You here can see here outcomes of self ratio to inputs of self compared with outcomes of other to inputs of other. This comparison, it is called equity comparison. If it is equal, yes, such a good society I am living in. In comparison, my input and my output with other people input and output outcomes and inputs Yes, it is so fair. I am living in equity, equity-based community, equity-based society. Do you think that capitalistic system, economic system can create fair equity society or not? How do you think about the capitalism? Do you think capitalism can create an equity-based society? For example, look at the Society of America as the symbolic, greatest symbol of capitalism all around the world. The richest country all around the world is America. And the highest rate of homelessness all around the world is again for America. It is not about money. It is about the distribution of money. We know that which country in the earth produce more than any other countries? America, more than China, more than India. But one of the worst countries for homeless people is America. Why? Because of economic system is capitalism. It is about imperialism. Imperialism is something else about the dominancy to other people, to other countries. But capitalism basically doesn't anything know about, doesn't know anything about the equity-based community. Why? Because it is related to your job. It is related to your money. It is related to your growth. Yes the greatest financial motivator society is capitalistic society, yes. If you live in, for example, Sweden, you work for a long time and with the highest sense of security. But you, never be, you will never be rich, never. Why? Because it is social, you will pay about 70% of your income as the tax with the high rate of social security, social services. It is a fair distribution of money, yes. But many people doesn't have any motivation for growing, why? Because it is not so important that you work or you don't work or you grow very high or you, you are popularity. Everybody is popular. It is not communistic system. It is socialistic system. In the other hand, in the opposition part is capitalistic economic system with the major figure of US. And after that, other capitalistic system. Some of them are social capitalistic, for example, France, Germany, Canada, they are social capitalistic. Basically, it is capitalistic. It is 
related to the investment, related to the money, related to producing and turnover of money in the country, but have a good services for poor people. In that part, it is called social, but again, about the uh, producing money and production and uh, tools of production, it is about capitalism. Do you know who was the, which philosophers or philosopher was the greatest and uh, most well-known philosopher uh, as the enemies of capitalism? What were the thought leaders of, for example, old Russian system? Thought leaders, not the leaders, thinking philosophers, do you know? And they were not Russian. Have you heard the name of Marx and Marxism? Yes. Marx and Engels, especially Marx, was the first person who talked about the damn part of capitalism. And he was the greatest enemy of capitalism and the intellectual leader of some communistic system like old Russia before getting out the countries from the major Russian part. This is Marx. Marx was a philosopher, economic philosopher, thinker about the history of economy and history of money, and especially with the emphasis on working class in contrast with the feudalistic part of the society. Okay, have a 15 minutes break and after that we will be here again, okay? okay.
Welcome again. We are continuing the discussion about the motivation for another one hour. And after that, it is the time of third week quiz. Okay. Okay. The expectancy theory of motivation. We have two types of learning. One type, it is learning about the conditions. What does it mean? There's a stimuli in your life that motivate you to react or response. So at the first, it is a stimulus. And after that, it is response. It is called conditional learning or conditional learning. But another learning, it is called operational learning or operant learning. Operant learning is mean that the motivator of your behavior is not the stimulus before you, is the expectancy of your future. For example, in parenting, you have some good expectancy for your future of your child. So a lot of things you are doing now, it is not because of the today's needs. Today needs are very simple. You do a lot of extra things for the future of your children. It is the, because of expectancy of the future. Or now for education. You are educating now and we, you want to do something and to know extra information about the analyzing the future of the leadership, of the management, of the business. Why? Because your expectation is that these type of data, these type of information can broad and can bigger changes, can make bigger changes in your mind about the business and other related topics to business for management and leadership. It is expectancy. So be careful that a lot of human being in contrast with other mammals, other animals, a lot of human beings behaviors are not very simple reaction or simple response to the external stimulus. Many, many, many human reactions, human uh, actions are because of the expectancy of the future. So good expectancy, powerful, positive expectation about the future is a great motivator for many human actions. Motivation depends on how much we want something and how lucky we think we are to get it about the wanting and expectation of getting. Key components are effort to performance expectancy, performance to outcome expectancy, outcomes and values. Effort to performance expectancy is mean the perceived probability that effort we lead to performance, which is different. Sometimes you have a lot of efforts, but you cannot have a good performance. At the first expectancy is the perceived probability that yes, my effort will lead to good performance. Performance to outcome. The perceived probability that performance will lead to certain outcomes. So effort, performance, outcome. What is your expectancy? Expectancy of leading the effort to performance, it is effort to performance expectancy. Expectancy to gain the certain outcome from your performance is performance to outcome experience. An outcome, anything that result from performing a behavior is called outcome. And valence, the degree of attractiveness or unattractive is value that a particular outcome has for a person. It is called valence or value. The portal lower model is the focuses on rela relationship between satisfaction and performance. One of the basic questions for every human motivation is that why we do a lot of things, a lot of tasks, a lot of educations, a lot of money, a lot of facilities in our life, good job, good money, good car, good house, good wife, good husband, good family, but we are not satisfied. We are not happy. It is very basic philosophical question 
in the all human history of philosophy and I'm thinking about the human basic relationships problems. Why? Because we think that relationship is the basic components of every human happiness, every type of human happiness. It is related to relationship. Also relationship to God, relationship to your pet, relationship to your co-workers. It is not uh, always about the intimate and sexual relationships. It is about the social but satisfactory relationships. Focuses on relationship between satisfaction and performance. Assessment assume that if rewards are adequate, high level of performance may lead to satisfaction. Satisfaction is determined by the perceived equal equity of intrinsic, intangible, and extrinsic tangible rewards for performance. What is your definition of intrinsic or intangible rewards? How can a reward be intangible? Can you say me the name, the title of some intangible rewards? Tangible rewards is very clear. For example, money is tangible rewards. Or say, well done, it's very good. Tangible, intangible reward. What is the meaning of intangible rewards? Nothing about the intangible rewards. Intangible rewards. Like, not um, in praise, yeah. like praise or recognition. Yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry, I just don't want to be, um, I don't want to, um, if Jaime wants to say something, I just don't, I want to give her a second to say it before I be a motor mouth. <laughs> no problem. Some of the intangible rewards are the rewards that you perceive that they are rewards. In psychology of success, there is a major part of the title of self-motivation. Self-motivation is very important. When you are alone, when you don't have good enough external motivator, and for whole your whole of your life, you need some instruments for self-motivations. It is very important. Intangible rewards are relative to your self-motivation procedure that you use for motivating yourself, for continuing the hard road and the hard roadmap to your success, to achievement, to desirable outcomes you want to have in life. Major parts are intangible. They are not tangible because it is your, about your self-motivation. For example, yes, I am at the right position. Appreciation, gratitude, thanksgiving are the major parts of self-motivation and major parts of intangible rewards for performance. But tangible rewards are external rewards. Gifts that you give from the um, external part, environmental uh, components of your life, from your organization, from your family members, from your society. So really intangible and subjective rewards that in many times, in a lot of times, you give to yourself, not uh, your external environment. You give to yourself. They are very important in the discussion about the self-management. You see, or again, this model, Porter lower model value of reward and perceived effort reward, probability and effort, abilities and traits and other things. Guidelines for using expectancy theory. First, determine the primary outcomes each employee wants. Each employee should know that what you want from him or her. What is your expectancy level? What do you want? What do you expect him or her to gain and to achieve after ending, for example, a task? Decide what level of kinds of performance are needed to meet organizational goals. At first part, we are talking about our coworkers, about our employees. The second part, we are talking about the prioritizing the needs and the level of needs 
that which is very important at the ranking of first ranking of, for example, our organization. And after that, make sure that desirable of performance are possible. It is called feasibility study or possibility study. Feasibility study is the study of how feasible a task you want from your employees or how feasible is the market you are marketing for your productions. Different aspect of feasibility study you can do in industrial engineering, in management, in leadership, even industrial psychology, we use feasibility study. Make sure that your desired levels of performance are possible and link desired outcome on desired performance. This is organization. This is organizational needs. These are your employees and these are your expectations. Harmonization within these components can create a good expectation level for your organization. Very real, very feasible and very possible expectation for your organization. For example, if you have some out of training or no trained people as your employees and you want some high level requirements, some high level needs of for your organization, it is impossible. And feasibility and possibility study will reject these expectations. In this study says, sorry, you cannot reach that level of expectation for your organization with these untrained and without trained or unprofessional, not professional, not expert people. So the harmonization between your organizational needs, your expectation from your employees and the harmonization between two parts, performance and outcomes create a feasible and a possible level of expectation for your organization. Analyze the situation for conflicting expectances. It is very important. Between approaching something and avoiding something, it is the meaning of conflict. The conflict, very simple definition of conflict is the same, at the same time, we have approaching and avoidance to something. We are approaching and we are avoiding. It is conflictual situation, I don't know. For example, in parental situation, we have a lot of conflictual situation. Why? Because of your love of your good sense of your kindness, you want to have some approach to your parents. And because of generational gap and that they don't know why, what are you talking about? And you can understand what are they talking about? It is generational gap. You should avoid them. It is conflictual. Now it is between hate and love, but it is between approach and avoid. Make sure the rewards are large enough. It is very important. Uh, the law of diminishing returns uh, says that if your rewards are very regular and after sometimes people uh, think that, yes, with lower or a higher level of performance, with lower and higher level of outcomes, there's no difference between the reward they are receiving. It is called the law of diminishing returns. The return of your expectation because of your reward will diminish. So always personnel, always coworkers, always employees should know that. There is a serious and severe difference <coughs> between the different level of functioning, different level of performance. The performance, different performance should include different type and different volume of reward, different amount of reward. Make sure the overall system is equitable for everyone. The sense of equity is very important in all aspects of organization because organizations and corporations and companies are the small and sometimes great, but generally are the small samples of your society. In society, we need equity. For example, when you uh, look at the movement, uh, the late movement, so-called that, uh, Black Lives Matter, it was about inequality in the uh, organization. A major part, African uh, American people are a major part of uh, American society as a great protest against uh, what is this? What are uh, doing with us? We are not minor. We are the major part of African American. And it is not, uh, it is not about the minority or majority. It is about the equity in a democratic society, in the most democratic society 
and most liberal, liberal society in the world is US. So when they can come to a street and have a good protest and sometimes with their violence, sometimes with the aggression, sometimes no very peaceful protest against the inequity. The sense of equity in the organization is very important, especially in some countries like America that you can cover a lot of different races, a lot of different ethnicity, a lot of different uh, nationality. This is very important. Nobody says can say that, yes, I am native, native, native American. Native American is Indian American. Everybody is immigrant here with a different time of immigration. For example, from oh, 1494, the conquest of paradise by Americano and Christopher Columbus, just now it is about, I think, 500 years, okay? Because of this, America is very immigration acceptance country, very immigration, based, uh, based on the immigrant people. Because of that, you should know as a manager, as leader, how to work with different culture, different races, different ethnicity, different nationalities. And at the first part, it is very important to consider equity in your organization as the basic part. Out of the legal problems, we are not talking about the legal problem. It is not a course of organization law. It is about the organization theories. It is about the how can we lead an organization as a manager or as a leader. The third part, the third category of uh, motivation perspective, it is learning based. Learning has been a relatively permanent change in behavior, behavioral potential resulting from direct or indirect experience. So the key components, the key words of the learning is at first change. Change is the greatest, most important keyword of learning. If change doesn't occur, learning doesn't occur. You see a lot of people, you know a lot of people with a lot of direct or indirect experience, but there is no change. Why? Because there is no feedback. As Andre Robin says, there is no uh, failure, only feedback. There is no such thing as failure. Andre Robin says, there is no such thing as failure, only feedback. It's true. Always there are some types of outcome, desirable outcome and undesirable outcome. There is no such thing as failure or even success. Something you are called success is desirable outcome. Something you are called uh, failure, it is undesirable outcome. So at first, the basic criteria of diagnosing that learning has occurred or not, it is about change. After that, the second keyword, it is about permanent change, relatively permanent, not absolutely. And the third part is about experience and rehearsal. <clears throat> In some books says it is resulting from direct or indirect experience or rehearsal. For example, studying the books, studying your courses. <clears throat> if you have some permanent changes in your mind or mindset or literacy, it is not about experience, it's about rehearsal. For example, mathematical rehearsal. It's a permanent change in your mind, yes. It is about experience. Experience is about the external work. So a relatively permanent change in behavior or behavioral potential resulting from direct or indirect experience or rehearsal. How learning occurs, traditional view, classical conditioning, we talked about it. A simple form of learning that links a condition response with an unconditioned stimulus. <coughs> Contemporary learning as a cognitive process. Assume people are conscious, active participants in how they learn. It is very important view, very important view. That consider people as scientists. In this view, we assume that every man, every woman is nat a natural born scientist, a modern born scientist. He or she is active participant, not unconsciously, consciously an active participant in learning. Because of that, we call it, for example, skill training. A skill training is not about your unconscious, it is about your conscious. You are actively participating in the training and learning their skills. Reinforcement theory and learning, these are very 
simple. I will talk. Uh, I talk about the operant conditioning. Behavior is a function of its consequences of action, not about about the expectancy, about the consequences of action, and reinforcement in the consequence of behavior. Types of reinforcements. It is not so relative to you. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, avoidance, extinction, and punishment. A reward or other desirable consequences that a person receives after exhibiting behavior, it is positive reinforcement. Every consequence that increases the recurrency of an action, it is positive reinforcement. Every action, every consequences that reduces the possibility of recurrency of action, it is called negative reinforcement or punishment. Sometimes positive reinforcement is called rewards and negative reinforcement or avoidance or punishment. Extinction is this decreases the frequency of behavior but eliminating a reward or desirable consequences that follows that behavior. For example, euphoria is a good consequence of substance abuse of drinking alcohol. It's a good consequence for them. The sense of trance, the sense of I am not here, euphoria, fantastic confabulation about themselves and about the world. If someone is alcoholistic and you want the extinction, create extinction for this behavior, you should destroy the good and the favorable and the desirable consequences of drinking alcohol. Because of that, some medications use and you will eat a pill and after drinking alcohol, you have something like hyper vomiting, like morning sickness of pregnant uh, women. It's a very, very bad situation for using alcohol. After that, it is called avoidance, it is called um, Avoidance therapy, no, it is, I forgot the name of the type of therapy we use for this one, this type of therapy. After that, the good outcome, the desired outcome, we destroy. Always you drink and go to the other part or you're uh, using the substance, abusing substances and medication and drugs for going to euphoria. But now you will have a, good, a very, very bad feeling. It is extinction. And after that decreases the frequency, of, for example, of alcohol. And punishment and unpleasant, or it is aversive therapy, I uh, remember. It is aversive, aversion therapy. Aversion therapy, it is about, for example, using medication for changing the consequences of a pre-operations, pre-behaviors, which was very, pleasurable, very desirable for the users. After destroying the good consequences and switch them to the very aversion, very aversive behaviors, unpleasant punishment, the behavior will be extinct, will be off. Action present the stimulus, positive, positive reinforcement, negative decreases the behavior, the recurrence of frequency. Social learning in organizations. Social learning in organizations is about bandera. Occurs when people observe the behaviors of others, recognize their consequences, and alter their own behavior as a result. It is very simple in the history of human being that the major part of learning is because of looking at other people. It is very, very simple. But I don't know why in psychology we notice to this type of learning so late. At first, we look at the, how animals learn the skills. Because of that, we talk about the circus psychology. <laughs> circus psychology is that part of learning psychology that we use to train the animals for circus. It is called by joke, circus psychology, learning psychology, conditioned psychology, behaviorism. 
But Albert Bandura says and has a lot of experiments about this theory that yes, elite people, acceptable people are very important source of learning in um, life of everybody. And it is called social learning in organizations, conditions for social learning. Behavior being observed and intimated must be relatively simple. Intimidation or modeling is very important. Imitation and <coughs> modeling is very important. Two, observed and imitated behavior must be concrete, not intellectual. At first, it should be simple. Secondly, the behaviors should be observable, concrete, not intellectual. Learners must have the physical ability to imitate the observed behavior. It is about imitation. It is about the modeling, copying. First, the behavior should be simple. Second, it should be observable. Third, it should be, we, uh, the learner should have the enough physical ability to imitate the observation, the learning. And after that, practice, and progress, practice and progress, practice and progress. Organizational behavior modification or OB mode. Um, what are the differences between behavioral change and behavioral modification? How do you think? Is there any technical, any professional differences between modification or change or not? Is there any difference between changing behavioral change and behavioral modification and behavioral therapy? Therapy. What is the definition of modification? We have four stage, modification, change, transcendence, and transformation. We have four words here modification, change, transcendence, and transformation. The ultimate level is transformation. The basic level is modifying, modification. What are the differences between these words? Modification, change, transcendence, and transformation. Sometimes people say, some expert people say that no, at first transformation, after that transcendence, some experts says, including me that no, at first it is transcendence and after that it is the final part is transformation. But the basic deal, what are the differences between change and modification, especially in the behavioral approach? Change is um, you act a different way or um, where modification is just you kind of um switch the way you were doing something uh -huh. and transcending is going like a, a a beyond and transformation um transformation be um evolving evolving with what with something which has transcendent before Evolving of what? At uh, the same page of transcendence, transformation will occur or not? What is the content of evolution in transformation? Yes, you are right. The key word in transformation is evolution, evolving, I know. But what is the basic material for ev evolving? The same material that which we have previously in the transcendence stage and before that in changing a stage, and before that in modifying a stage, are the same material, are the same adjectives, same traits, same characters, same features or not? We have some new, not the skills, new features, new character. You are talking about transformation, not about the modification. Modification, as you said, this is very simple. At the same level, we have some corrective actions. It is modification. Mm -hmm. 
changing is the same level, but not the same features. Yes. The same, but not the new features. When the new features go to the new level, it is transcendence. Yes. <laughs> but it is not a stable. <clears throat> when transcendence will be your lifestyle, it is transformation. <clears throat> so the difference between transcendence and transformation is not about the material, it was about the persistency. New level include transcendence and transformation, new level, new level of consciousness. It is called altered status, states of consciousness. Hmm. <clears throat> but the same level and the same elements, it is modification. At the same level with different elements, it is change. Same, not the same, new level and new elements, it is called transcendence. And permanent new level and new elements is called transformation. Thank you Transform for explaining that why. Transformation is very deep, very, very deep. It's a Thank very you, deep like that explanation. Yeah, it is about your changing basically. Hmm. Sometimes, for example, in uh, Transgenders, sometimes they want to say that, yes, it is about transgender, it is transformation of sexuality. New level, new feature. It is not about, for example, some improve of sexual behaviors or sexual orientation. When you are talking about transformation, it is the deepest part of changing. It is not regular. It is possible? Yes. Yes, it is possible but it is not easy at all, not easy at all. The application of reinforcement theory to people in organizational setting. You can see it, schedules of reinforcement. It is continuous, fixed interval, variable interval, fixed ratio and variable ratio. <coughs> when we are talking about the schedules of reinforcement, we have five types of reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement, reinforcement with fixed intervals, ratio are different and intervals are fixed. Reinforcement with variable interval, reinforcement with fixed ratio and variable ratio. Behavior is reinforced every time it occurs. It is continuous behavior, reinforcement, reinforcement. Behavior is reinforced according to some predetermined constant schedule based on time. It is fixed interval, predetermined, it is fixed. Behavior is reinforced, reinforced after periods of time, but the time span varies from one time to the next time. It is variable inter interval. Yes, the expand is the same, but the duration, the intervals are not the same, it is not fixed. Also fixed ratio and variable ratio like it. Okay, we can talk about a little about the other parts of our chapter, the next chapter, we can talk about the little. Because it is in the continuous of discussion about motivation. Using the theories of motivation, you talk about traditional and perception based and learning based and process based and different types of areas we can talk about the motivation. All are correct, yes. Now after 9-11, it has been great gap in psychology about the spirituality. A lot of psychologists have, a lot of professional psychologists, academic psychologists are working for the last 20 years. Yes, 9-11 is 2001 and next year is 2021. It is past about 20 years, the next year. Now it is near 20 years. The spirituality is the major part, major part of new approaches in psychology major part of 
psychology using the theories of motivation. No single theory explains motivation. Each theory covers only some factors that motivate behaviors at first. You should combine these theories of motivation together in accordance with your needs in your organizations. What type of organization you have, what type of leader you are, what, what are the environment you are working with and you and your organization, different components, different factors, different elements can shape or F, uh, impact the usage of motivation theories. More than one theory or method can be used to enhance performance in our organization. No limitation. Each theory or method must be translated into operational terms. In science, also in leadership science, in management science, we have two types of definitions. First, conceptual definition. Second, operational definition. For example, we are talking about the IQ, intelligence questions. At first, we should have a conceptual definition of intelligence. What is intelligence? Courtney, what is intelligence? You go to doctor, to psychologist, say that your beautiful daughter is intelligent, smart, very clever, or not very simple. At first, the doctor asks you, Courtney, what are you worrying about? You say, I'm worrying about the intelligence. And he or she asks you, sorry, what is intelligence? What do you mean of saying intelligence about your beautiful daughter? What is your definition, conceptual definition of <laughs> intelligence? My conceptual definition would be their ability to um, learn new tasks and perform tasks. That would be the intelligence like a conceptual definition. Discovering and understanding the secret part of life is a part of intelligence or not? Is it a type? Of, I believe it is a type of intelligence, yes. Is it important for you as a mother or not? Which part? Finding the secret parts of life. Finding the secret parts of life? Yes. As a mother, are you worrying about your daughter to have such type of intelligence or not? <clears throat> yes, I would worry as a mother to make sure they have, yes, that they have the ability to learn, observe, and perform. Yes. These are the core in defin conceptual definition of intelligence for herself or for her daughter. Hi, man. What is your conceptual definition? We are not talking about the operational. We will tell you that what is the components of operational definition of intelligence, for example, as a very popular concept. Anya, what is your definition of intelligence? <clears throat> so my? Yes, your my... definition of intelligence. Um... What are the components of definition you think? What is the major concept of uh, the intelligence as a very, very old and popular concept in psychology, in sociology, in history, in philosophy? It is very simple. Everybody has talked about the intelligence from at least 2,000 years ago. Since 2,000 years ago, we have some books about the intelligence. Yes, they are not academic uh, psychology. I know, but it's philosophy. These are the books, these are the ideas, these are very important ideas, at least since 2000 years ago. For such a very popular and very broad concept of human being, you say us your definition, conceptual definition of intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> like I think like uh, so for my conceptual um, definition because like uh, I think like 
Mm. Like conceptual definition, think of like trying to explain it to like a elementary school kid. Like how would you describe what intelligence is? That's how I try to think of it if I'm going to do like a conceptual definition. Let me ask in another way. Courtney, do you think you are an intelligent woman? Yes. Why? Because I have a high ability. I am asking about the operational definition. It is not about the conceptual. Yes. I am asking about the real person and ask him herself or her husband or her her mother, her daughter, even her professor ask, is Courtney an intelligent woman? He said, she says, yes, I'm intelligent. After that, I ask about the operational features of intelligence. What can we see in a daily life from a lady like Courtney that shows she is an intelligent woman, an intelligent mother, an intelligent manager. And sometimes she is an intelligent mother, but not an intelligent manager. Sometimes she is an intelligent manager, but not intelligent wife. So we don't have a very unique concept of intelligence for all aspects of life. Because of that, I ask you, Courtney, do you think you are intelligent? You say, yes, I think I'm intelligent. I ask, why? What the actions, what the behaviors I can see if I have an observational tools for daily observation, uh, daily observing your uh, behaviors. What are the major intelligent components of daily activities? Do you want me to answer or Jaime? No, you. Oh, so the um, so you would be able to observe that I have the mental capacity to First, mental capacity for what? To perform um, everyday activities and emotionally, I can read people. So you are saying us that autonomy ability to do the per daily per autonomy is Mm -hmm. one feature of intelligence for you okay yes so you say that to be autonomous and autonomy is for courtney is a major component for to be intelligent people who are autonomous are more intelligent second the the, um then you could go more analytical. Analytical. Um, so analytical and philosophical and mathematical thinking yes, is the second right. component of intelligence for Courtney. First, then, autonomy. Two, intellectual abilities. Three, and then uh, creative, creative abilities. Um, what do you mean of creativity? Uh, to be able to think. I know. What do you mean? Oh, sorry. I know. What do you mean of saying, yes, creativity is a one component, one element, one factor that in determination of operational. Operational not conceptual. I, I agree with you. How do you, uh, well, how do you define the creativity? New ideas, new solutions, new yeah. problems. Finding new problems is and one so- major part. Asking question, asking good, right question is a major part of intelligence. It's a major part. Mm-hmm. Even you cannot find the answers. Finding the, it is not creative thinking, it is critical thinking. When you are talking about the new question, it is not creative thinking, it is critical thinking. But yeah. when you are trying to find a new answer, it is about the creative thinking. And these are two major parts of intelligence, as you said. So autonomy, intellectual abilities, creative thinking, critical thinking. Are you an intelligent mother? in contrast yes. with other mothers you know? I believe so, yes. Why? Because all the things we What just... are the behaviors you, your daughter can see from you that say, I'm proud of you, my mother. You are so intelligent. <laughs> Why do you think that you are a, an intelligent mother for your, how many years is your child? Um, I have an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old. Okay, for example, for eight, eight years is daughter or both of them are daughters? Uh, my daughter is eight and my son okay. is nine. What are the major parts, major behaviors that your eight-year-old daughters see from you and say, I'm proud of you, my mother. You are so intelligent as a mother in our role, not as a manager, not as a leader, not as a wife, not as a uh, girl for your mother, as a mother for your child. 
what are your maternal intelligence behaviors? In her eyes, I believe it could be anything even as simple as when we're doing our arts and crafts or um, uh -huh. getting something to stick together and the glue's not working. So we'll move on and we'll do some sewing stuff and then this works. And she thinks it's brilliant. <laughs> so you are saying us that happiness is a major part of intelligence? You think, believe that happy people are intelligent people? No, I don't think you have to be. Um, it's a factor, but I don't think it's a major thing. Mm -hmm. But, but I think creative, her watching me is very good. Yes, creative creative is very important. The way she watches me uh, solve a problem. Mm. Thanks for contribution, your personal experience, because I needed to have some operational definitions, and these are the operational definitions. So. Can we define the operational definition of intelligence, for example, for every single organization, for that specific organization? Yes. It is like dress. Dresses are made in mass production, but you go to fitting room. Yes, dresses are made in mass production, but for every human, single human being, go to the fitting room. Fit that dress with your specific features. Your trousers is your trousers. It is not, for example, for a scarf. At this mass production, yes, you go to Nordstrom and buy and see a lot of, for example, trousers. But go to fitting room that, yes, these trousers is good for me, is fit for me. The word is not goodness room. It is fitting room. Fitting room is a, has a very good philosophical concept. It says that, yes, it should be fit for you. A lot of people are seeking for good things, but the smart people are looking for fit things. Why? Because when something is fit you, it is always good for you. But sometimes something, it is good, but not fit for you. Sorry, it doesn't work for you. It is a smart part of management, yet it's a smart of management and also leadership. Job design, <clears throat> how organization define and structure jobs? Job is specific, Frederick Taylor. Who was Frederick Taylor? You remember? Can you repeat the question, please? Okay. Well, who was Frederick Taylor? We talked about it about 15 minutes before, 15 minutes ago. Who was Frederick Taylor? I should give you the grade zero for final grade. When you are educating in business and management and you don't know who is Frederick Taylor. It is the father of your job. The father of scientific management is Frederick Taylor. If somebody awake you in the midnight and say, hey, me, who is Taylor? Hey, me, she says, it's the father of scientific management. Good night. Frederick Taylor is the first and the best name for scientific management. The father of, for example, we say the father of psychopathology, the first one who talk and provide a model about why people became psychiatric illness is Freud. Freud, the father of psychopathology, not uh, the father of psychology, the psychopathology. The first person who came to organizations and provide some models and some concept for management of the organization was Frederick Taylor at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of starting years of 20th century. And the first concept was job specialization. What is the other phrase you can use for job specialization? What does it mean? Can you, uh, can you say me an alter, alternated, alternative word for job specialization? Expertise. Expertise. Hmm. Yes, but you can be an expert, but not about only job. 
when you are talking about job specialization, you are talking about the organizations. A side question, what is different between uh, business owner and self-employer? What is the difference? We have four words. First, employee. Second, self-employee. Third, business owner. Four, entrepreneurship. What is the difference between self-employee and business owner? A business owner could be in charge of multiple employees where self-employed could be in charge of just themselves. Yes. And in salary, what are the differences in salary and in time, work time? Uh, well, self-employed, you'd think um, they're in charge of their own salary and their own hours, their mm -hmm. own income, and a business owner has to distribute distribute the salaries amongst their employees. Well, uh, most important than everything that business owner cannot work in a lot of times because he or she has his or her organization, the organization working and producing money. But self-employee is just related to the hours he or she is working. With self-employee, you will have money. With business ownership, you will have wealth, something more than money in different aspects of your life. An entrepreneurship is something else. You create several businesses and you share a lot of, a little part of them and give the businesses to other people. You are entrepreneur. Your expertise, your proficiency is creating new jobs, which is very popular now in the world. Jobs should be scientifically studies broken down into a small component task and then standardized across all workers doing those jobs. Follow Adam Smith's concept of the division of labor, labor division, labor div dividing is not related to the pay tailor, it is the Adam Smith. Adam Smith, who is Adam Smith? Do you know? So I should have some exam about the names of the great figures in your proficiency. Who is Adam Smith? It is he, very he good can... luck for you. It is very good luck for you that you are not my master degree you, student. You just said that um, he is, he created the concept of the division of labor. Yes, I said, but it is only said I said. What do you know extra in say, what saying uh, by me about Adam Smith? If you were my MBA students, it was a very bad situation for you. Very, very bad situation. That you don't know who is Adam Smith as an MBA. As a bachelor degree, yes, not too bad. So searching the internet, who is Adam Smith, the father of? The father of? What is the science of money? What is the name of the science of money? What you call the science of money? It is called economy. Adam Smith is the father of economy as a science. The first greater person, thinker person in the field of economy it is Adam Smith. Also, we don't know when Adam Smith is the father of economy, we don't know the mother of economy. You can find it, the mother of economy also <clears throat> by Jude. So Frederick Taylor is the father of scientific management and Adam Smith with the great book by, by the title of Capital. The Capital, the book by the title of Capital is the Adam Smith first book about the capital, not about only money. Capital is not money. For example, in psychology, we have psychological capital in organization, it is very important. And the last question for deep thinking, what is the difference between assets and capital? Is there any differences or not? Between asset and capital, asset and investment, asset and 
income, asset and capital. I'm satisfied with asset and capital. What is the difference between asset and capital? You cannot find it in internet so fast <clears throat> because it is a conceptual question, not a definition-based question. Yes, you can find who is Adam Smith, the father of economy with the book so titled with capital and other things. But what is the conceptual differences between, what are the conceptual differences between asset and capital? Well, assets can be long-term or fixed and capital refers to like money or investments. Uh -huh. and, um, I told you we have a phrase in psychology, it is called psychological capital. It is meant for psychological money. I don't know what the source you are searching, but it is not true. It is not deep. Yes, it is true, but not deep. I did, um, assets add value over time. Assets of, are the sources of producing money. Mm -hmm. okay. For example, for example, producing values, something more than money. For example, your bank saving is not your asset. It is your capital because it is saving. But your money in the stock market is your asset. The value of your home is not your asset because you cannot produce anything with your home. Only go home and have a good night. <laughs> Assets are the source of producing the values, the money, the extra things. Capital are that part of source that you can change between different points. For example, your age is the most important asset of your life. Why? It is the only source you have. You don't have anything but your time. Other assets is related to others. Your wife, your husband, your educational level, your uh, social level, your uh, prestige and other parts. Your relationships, these are not related to your time. The only thing that it is your own private asset is your time, time of life. But you can invest this asset in different parts. For example, one part of your time for your graduation, one time for your play, one time for your uh, love life, one time for your job life and other parts. It is capital investment. Secondly, capital is potential. Asset is not potential. Asset is very active. And what are the more activating part of capital and asset? It is called investment. You invest in different, on different aspects of your life. It is not related to money. You invest your age on your children. You invest your time on your education. You invest your time, for example, your money on your food, invest. So investment is something different. These are basic concepts. Please note that these are basic concepts. Yes, you can consider all these phrases only in the context of business and economy. But this word has been before creating economy, before creating some science so-called leadership and management. Think about the basic concepts. If you want to be different, Thinking is the hardest thing a human being can do. Because of that, a lot of people are followers. Why? Because leadership is about thinking different. That's it. Leadership is about thinking different. Because of thinking is the hardest thing a human being can do. A lot of people, many people love to be followers not to be a leader. They say, yes, I want to be a leader. And I say, oh, what are the skills of leadership? Responsibility, accountability, and thinking out of the box. And I say, are you responsible? Yes, I'm responsible. Are you accountable? Yes, I'm accountable. Say, so why you are not a leader? 
they say, because of out of the box thinking. And when I pay attention, pay more attention to their thinking the start, I found that it is not about the out of the box thinking. It is about thinking. They don't think at all. To be follower is an easy life. To be leader is not so easy. But followers will not remain and leaders will remain with their thinking, with their production. And, and also it is related to your choice. It is not mandatory. If everybody's leader, so tell me who is a follower. Yes, I know there's a categorization, but you are studying in academy and in university. And it is expected that some of you have some good views about the future based upon the knowledge and based upon the literacy, the internalized knowledge is literacy. That part of knowledge that you are experiencing, experiencing internal, it is called literacy. Based out upon your knowledge and your literacy and your attitude, it is expected that some of you decide to be a leader. For this character, this part of your character, thinking is the most important part. Okay, you have sometimes about 15 minutes for quiz week three, yes, and next week. We have the midterm and uh, all questions are about from PowerPoints and also some question about your books, but the major questions are from PowerPoints, study the PowerPoints. If any problem in this week, send me an email. And final things is that don't postpone your LEs, your learning engagement, because it has some due date and I don't want to damage your final grade. You are trying so hard, I see. Any question, Courtney? Next, next Wednesday, we just log in for, and we're gonna take the test during this period of time. That's no, 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 no. Half of the time is about teaching, half of the time is about quiz. Okay. You come to the session, and after that, I will give you the password of quiz, and you send. But if you are a hybrid student, you should attend the class. You cannot pass, take the quiz after class. For yeah, online, yeah. online students, yes, they can. But hybrid students, they should come to class and for one hour, they take it. After that, it is ended, the time. That you are here. It is not important for you and also for Amy, for other students. Okay, okay have a good night. Yep, see you next week. You too.
Um, I am finished with my quiz. What do you say, Amy? Oh, I am finished with my quiz. Okay, okay, that's good. Mm. Is there any problem with the questions or not? Uh, the questions, I think it's, um, hmm. It's easy? Yes. Okay, have a good night. Okay, have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye.